I'm on location in Grant Hall, underneath the beautiful St. Elizabeth Church in Wilmington, Delaware. It is the site of the Vatican International Exhibition of the Eucharistic Miracles of the World and Carlo Acutis's First Class Relic. It's hosted by St. Elizabeth Church and by the Columbiettes, uh, the uh, pious St. Pius X Columbiettes. And it's an exhibition that's here this weekend, and we're going to talk about the exhibition, talk about uh, Blessed Carlo and um, his cause for sainthood, and about the relics that we have here uh, on Catholic Forum with my guests, who are uh, Dr. Bill Reichman and his wife, Mary Reichman. So let's get started. Uh, Dr. Reichman, uh, my first question, tell us about Blessed Carlo Acutis. Who was he? Carlo was born in London, England on May 3rd, 1991. His parents, very Italian, did not go to church. And in fact, at the time that he was born, his mother had been in church only three times. Her her, uh, baptism, her confirmation, and her wedding. That's the only three times that she had been in, in mass at church. Then they moved to Milan, Italy, when he was about three months of age. When he was three months of age, uh, I'm sorry, three years, he was um, given a Polish nanny. This po- he used to take this Polish nanny to the churches in Milan, spend half an hour in front of the Eucharist, and then go out and buy flowers for the Blessed Mother. He was three years old when he did this. And um, so he had this Polish nanny for the next three years. When he was six, he was starting to go to school. So he was given another caretaker whose name was Rashish. Now, as I said, he was six years old. Rashish took, him, took care of him for everything. And one thing that he liked about Carlo was Carlo always called him by his name. He said, Rashish. And Rashish commented, he said, I loved Carlo because he called me by my name. He treated me like a family member. Carlo did this to everybody in town. He would walk through Milan and he would see people sl- uh, sleeping on doorsteps and he would go and he would take his money and he would buy them a sleeping bag. He would bring them food. Um, he worked in the food bank. He did so many different things. By the time he was eight years old, he converted Rashish to Catholicism. And Rashish says, how did he do that? I was listening to a six-year-old boy And he taught me about the Blessed Mother, the Holy Mass, and and Jesus Christ. And he said, I became a Catholic. And uh, when Carlo was seven years of old age, he became, he received his first Holy Communion. Ordinarily, it's not till nine or 11 in Italy, but he knew so much about our Lord that they gave him permission. From that day on, he never missed a day. Went to Mass, Holy Communion, and prayed the rosary every single day for the rest of his life. When he was 11, he started teaching CCD for his mother. She was coming back to the church, and he took over her class. When he was 11 and a half, he bought textbooks, college textbooks, on how to um, become a computer programmer. Now, we're talking about the year 2000, 2001. There wasn't very much on the Internet at that time, but he spent all of his time researching things on the internet and that's how he came to compile all of these display that's behind me um there's 157 different eucharistic miracles that he found on the internet and f- most of them the local ones he took all of the pictures so when you look at this display those are all actually his photographs and most of it is also his writings so here's a young man at a mere child who really didn't have much of a Catholic influence in his life Correct. except for his Polish nanny right. but he had this fervor this this thirst this holiness that could only be a gift from God exactly yeah. yeah and in fact he considered the Eucharist his highway to heaven he said he never wanted to spend a, a minute of his time that wasn't pleasing to God and he lived his entire life like that. Although, at the same time, he was an ordinary kid. Yeah. Ordinary kid. He played soccer. He was terrible at it, his mother said, but he had a lot of friends. He loved to ski. He played the saxophone. And um, he, he just was an absolutely ordinary child. Then when he was um, 15, and 15 years of age, and in fact, it was on October 5th, 2006, he was given the diagnosis of leukemia. 
He had been sick maybe two or three days before. Everybody, all of his f classmates had the flu, and they thought that's what he had. But he was diagnosed with leukemia. And interesting, on that day, he said to his mom, he said, Mommy, don't worry about me. I'm not going to get out of this alive. God gave me an alarm clock, and I can hear the bell ringing. And then he said, Mommy, when you have more children, you'll know I'm in heaven. Four years later, to the exact date of his death, which was October 12, 2006, she had twins, a boy and a girl. She was 44 years old. That itself is a miracle. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, how did you get interested in, in uh, Carlo? Okay, actually, we got interested in his display first. Um, we had been to World Youth Day in Buenos Aires, oh, I'm sorry, in um, Australia, and we met Father Pizze, who had the miracle of Buenos Aires. And what uh, year was that? 2008. Eight. So not, not uh, long after his passing. But we didn't know anything about that. Right. We, yeah. we knew that a, a person by the name of Carlo Acutis had compiled this display. We had no idea who he was, no idea how old he was. Um, that's all they said about him. So. We finally found out about him during the point of his beatification, like right before the beatification when all the news was coming out about this young man. So that's how we found out about Carlo. And then through reading and investigating his life, we found out these, these various um, details. But he was a young boy who was extremely devoted to the Eucharist um, and felt that everybody needed to know exactly what and who we were receiving with, with receiving the Eucharist. Um, so he had a fascination with Eucharistic miracles. And um, in case our listeners might not be familiar with Eucharistic miracles, they're more common than some people might think, correct? I mean, the, uh, why don't you give us a couple of examples of Eucharistic miracles? Well, the first one is something that we see every single day when we go to church. When we go to Mass, Jesus Christ through a, comes down and changes that bread and wine into his body and his blood. The priest allows that to happen, and it happens every single day, but we're so unaware of it because it's something that happens. Something but that Catholics seem to take for granted. Exactly, take for granted. Yet, according to the newspapers, only 30% of Catholics actually believe that that is the real presence of Jesus Christ. So this is, I think, what Carlo was trying to do. He was trying to find proof that Jesus is fully present in the Eucharist. The first miracle happened in Lanciano, the first recorded one, in 750 A.D., okay? This was a, uh, a monk who had lost his faith, and during the act of consecration, when he elevated the host, it started to bleed and there was drops of red substance coming out of the host. He collected it into the um, chalice. And then he did something very different. He asked people, come up and look what happened. Look at this. And all these people were totally astonished that this is what happened. That host and the ca and captured blood is still present today in Lanciano. My way, Mary and I had the opportunity to see it in November when we visited Italy, and it's just absolutely amazing. The blood is as fresh as if it came from us today, and it was from 750. Wow. And the host, if they hook up wires to it, it will give you an active EKG tracing from the year 750. And these aren't superstitions. No, these no, are no, things no. that are proven and accepted by the church. That's correct. Well, the other miracle, like I said, was Buenos Aires when we met Father Pizze in Australia. And this is the one miracle that had started the scientific investigation into all the other miracles. And it's amazing what they found. They, um, the, the Vatican actually gave us approval, gave them approval to have the host and the blood analyzed. And they found that the host was truly human cardiac tissue. And the blood was as fresh as it was drawn today. They could even see the white blood cells, which usually die within 15 minutes of death that you no longer see. 
but that was the first evidence that they scientific that they could actually prove and then since then they have evaluated some of the other miracles that have happened and have found the same thing and every one of them have the same blood type a b now it's significant that the blood type is a b because it's the universal recipient that means that anybody can receive that type of blood but more importantly i think it means that Jesus will accept anyone who asks him for help. And I like to tell the children when I'm giving a talk at the schools or whatever, I think, say, think of you're in front of the crucifix and you're praying. Jesus' arms come off the cross and he hugs you and says, what is it, my child? How may I help you? That's what happens every day, every day. So young Carlo Acutis, teenager, very faithful, becomes interested or even obsessed with Eucharistic miracles. He's studying the, 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 the internet and he creates a website and on that website he lists all of, the, all of his research, correct? That's, that's correct, yeah. yeah. And his, his website is very simple, carloacutis.com. Yeah. And then from there you can find all sorts of things. Not only did he do the Eucharistic miracles, he also has a, a site uh, on there that talks about heaven, hell, and um, demons. He also has another one about heaven and purgatory. And he also has one uh, talks about the Marian apparitions. This young boy was so talented at 11, 12 years old, he devoted his entire life to, the, um, to researching all of these things to, to help each one of us to believe that Jesus is with us every day, every day. And uh, so, the exhibition that's here at St. Elizabeth and the exhibition that you take around to other parishes and schools, uh, that is, uh, was that, that's taken from his website, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, it's available, as I said, on the website. It's available in actually 17 different languages. And the one that we have is in English. And um, ours is a little bit different than most. We have it alphabetically by country. and. Um, inside the country it's chronologic so if you know of a certain miracle in a certain place you're going to go right to it but um there's about 157 panels but it and it'll take you about eight days to mm -hmm. look at it look at every one of them so to to make things easier a book is out there and it's called the eucharistic miracles of the world mm -hmm. and this book has every single thing that you see in the display so it's nice for us older people. We can take it home and read it at our leisure. It's nice for schools because they can have the kids go through it and look for certain things and get different ideas. That's great. So you also have relics from uh, Blessed Carlo Acutis. T yes, tell us yes. about that too. Well, okay, it was about 2013 or so when um, the first miracle occurred which started the cause for his um, beatification. So they had to move his body from his family site in Milan down to Assisi. Carlo had a wonderful fascination also with St. Francis. So he wanted to live in um, Assisi. And in fact, they had a summer home there. So when he died, they decided to move his body there. And w I like to say, can you imagine his mother's face when she opened the tomb seven years after he died and he looked the same exact way when she put him there, except that his hair was longer. So my Aunt Mary likes to say she wanted to make him presentable to the world, so she gave him a haircut. And she uses that hair to make relics. And this is the relic that we have, which happens to be borrowed from a parish in uh, Virginia, St. Um, Veronica Parish in Virginia, Chantilly. And if you, if you when, when you could pan in really close, you can see a white flower and black streaks. The black streaks are his hair. This morning, we went over to St. Hel uh, Hedwig Parish, and we had the wonderful opportunity to meet Father Andrew. And Father Andrew allowed us to borrow this beautiful relic also. This is a relic of St. John Paul the Great. And Looking in here, you can see a dark flower with gray hair, because obviously John Paul was a older. Bit older. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I just thought it was very different, and yet at the same time very 
um, specific, both are here. So um, what has been the response as you travel around the country uh, from the faithful who come and see this exhibit? Uh, what, what feedback are you getting? Oh, the tr it's absolutely phenomenal feedback. Mary does a lot of the talking with people as they come up to venerate the relic, and she finds all sorts of different things, different stories that people tell. Just their personal life and whatever um, difficulties they're going through at the moment, and many of them will be very willing to share um, and just find strength in the, the relic um, and having Carla to intercede for them, and also in the display, knowing that they are receiving Jesus and that he is there for them also. You know, um, this is what Carla was pointing to. But um, they're very open when they come and very, very, um, what do I want to say? Reverent, but also very um, willing to accept God's love and, and Carlo. And this is the year of the Eucharistic revival, so this is even you know, something that the U.S. bishops and every diocese and every parish are focusing on, the real presence of Christ Correct. in the Eucharist, so it's very timely. And Blessed Carlo is the, um, he is the patron for the first and second year mm -hmm. of the Eucharistic revival. When you give, your, you also get, are giving talks here at uh, St. Elizabeth, and, and, you'll be, and you give talks when you, when you travel around. Um, what what do you want people to take away from that? I want people to take away just exactly what Carlo wants people to take away. Jesus is fully present in the Eucharist. When we receive him, we are re when we receive the Eucharist, we're receiving him. It's not just a, a piece of bread. It's not just um, maybe a drop of wine. It's actually flesh and blood. Just like he told us, John chapter 6, uh, tells us all about the bread of life discourse. That's what it is. Jesus is our bread of life. But also, I think um, Carlo, because of his love of Jesus, exuded love to everybody around him. Yeah. And I think we need to look at him even as a young man, young boy, how Jesus worked through him and to show our young people that nobody is too, is too young or too old to show the love of Jesus in their life. Um, that we need to keep our young people in the right direction. And I think Carlo is one of their um, the model. model for them so that they can you know, look at him and say, look, he was, does everything I've done. He plays, he plays get sports, he plays games. Um, you know, he has friends, and they, they go out, and they do things, and yet look where he is, and where am I, and I need to follow. Very relatable. It, when, you, when young people think of saints, they might think of the apostles or, or St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, this is somebody that was alive in their, in their same century, yeah. and he played soccer and had the same, the same uh, emotions, yeah, interests and things. And when they look at... Um, when they look at him in the grave today, his body is intact. He's not incorrupt, but his body is intact. And I think the important thing to take away from that is he's dressed in his soccer uniform and sneakers. And as I often tell the children, did you ever see a saint dressed like that? And they're not. And there's a little um, animation, not an animation, one of the videos that are out there. Carlo is dressed up as Spider-Man <laughs> And one time he even sticks his tongue out at you. Yeah. And I say, did you ever see a saint do that before? <laughs> yeah. Carlo is, you know, he's for the youth of today. And the youth of today are our church of tomorrow. If we don't bring them back, we're not going to have anything to live for. And Catholics of all ages need to be reminded of the real presence of, of Christ in the Eucharist. And what exactly. a great gift that we have of the Eucharist. Speaking of the sainthood of, of Carlos, he is beatified, so that's the, that's the first step? First step, he has yeah. one miracle to his credit. That occurred in 2013 in Brazil. He, um, he cured a young boy, four years old. He only weighed 20 pounds. He had a pancreatic disorder, and uh, through his intercession, he was cured 
instantaneously. And when they did research on it, everything was actually back to normal. So, so, so then we're waiting for the next one, yeah. The second He only miracle, needs yeah. one more miracle. Yeah. And we know of a few that are in Rome. Hopefully they will be approved fairly soon. Yeah. Yeah. That's another thing that young people today can learn about uh, Blessed Carlo and live, obviously, hopefully, you know, in, if it's God's will, to see him can canonized, yeah. yeah. Now there's several books that are available, and these are just two of them. Uh, one is Carlo, the Millennial Saint. He's going to be the saint of the new millennium. And also this one is particularly important. This was written by his mother. So can you imagine all the different things, the different stories that his mother will tell about her young son who is soon to be a saint? That wow. It's a beautiful book. Yeah. It's a beautiful book. It goes right to the, her heart. Yeah. It's just beautiful. Have you, met, have you met his mother? No, we have not. But we're hoping to. She's supposed to be in Pennsylvania, I believe, Doylestown in September. So we're hoping to get there. That's great. Yeah. Well, Dr. Bill Reichman and Mary Reichman, thanks so much for being with us today on Catholic Forum. It was uh, fascinating to talk to you, and God continue to bless you and your work. Thank you. Thank you. It was good thank to you. be here.